Hello, my friends, across the fruited and rooted plain, coming to you from Proven Winners Color Choice Shrub Studio A. It's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Stacy, today we talk about the cut flower gardening trend, or some people will call it flower farming. Don't let that scare you off because you don't need a lot of space to grow some fresh cut flowers in your landscape. Uh, Stacy, this is a trend that I think is really rooted in the COVID pandemic when we were at home and uh, people started growing some of these cut flowers to have fresh flowers in the house. And this is a trend that uh, continues. You know, it's a trend that is absolutely firmly entrenched, and it's not just homeowners. In the nursery industry, we're seeing tons and tons of new flower farmers all across North America coming on, you know, starting their own flower farms. I think it actually goes back to a single Instagram user, Florette Flowers. So she owns a beautiful flower farm. I believe it's out in Washington oh, State. Yeah. And um, she started this Instagram account of sort of like depicting the glamorous part of flower farming. I'm sure there's some not so glamorous parts that you don't see on her Instagram <laughs> feed. And I think that it just sort of really clicked for people that, you know, cut flowers are wonderful and you can go buy them. But there is something so luxurious about having them right in your own backyard for you to take whenever you want to combine however you want. And just the creativity there, I think, has just been an absolute game changer for people. Yeah, and easy to do. And there are so many different types of cut flowers that you can grow. Uh, little pockets throughout your landscape or your yard where you can cut them and come again, whether it's zinnias, gomfrina, hydrangeas, roses, whatever it may be. Uh, it's certainly a trend that is taking off. And yes, you're right. Worldwide, you'll see these pick your own flower yeah gardens and you know I just came from the Netherlands and uh, I saw a lot of bouquets in stores of peony tulips now I love peony tulips um, they are not peonies they're tulips but the flowers look like peonies uh, that's a trend that we're seeing here in the United States as well as in Europe uh, it's just oh, the prices there were fabulous. I mean, I wished I could have brought a whole <laughs> bunch of them home with me. You know, and I have found that in other places uh, around the world where I've traveled too. And it comes down to simple supply and demand. Cut flowers are such an integral yeah. part of life, particularly in Europe. People buy them all the time. Like they would go to the store and buy, you know, bread or lettuce for a salad. They also pick up a bouquet of cut flowers. They're just part of their life. And we don't really have that so much in the U.S. And, you know, even though I used to live in the city where, you know, every corner bodega had a big thing of flowers mm -hmm. out there. When we don't have that demand, that supply is still going to be restricted and the prices are going to be high when there's high we're demand for the flowers, then right. the prices go down. So uh, we, we kind of did it to ourselves. But until we're out of that, growing your own cut flowers is a great solution. And you know, one thing I think that's really interesting, once you as a gardener start to cut from your garden, everything becomes a potential cut flower. Yeah. You know, we're, we're going to talk about lists of some of our favorites and some of the easy things that to grow. But you know, I, th I find that once I go out there and I find something to base a bouquet around, I start looking, well, you know, I'd actually like something that looks like this and I'm looking at you know the maple tree and I'm looking at some weeds and you know anything that I find growing around my yard sure. suddenly becomes fair game and it really just changes the way you think about what's growing in your yard. Yeah cut flowers you're right Stacy can be annuals perennials herbs flowering shrubs bulb plants tropical plants even vegetable plants sure yeah. the sky's the limit with it and why shouldn't we be able to enjoy them inside our house the same way we enjoy them uh, enjoy them outside. Uh, and, you know, we talk a lot on this show about hydrangeas. Hydrangeas are a natural. They sure are. For a cut flower. Who base. can resist? Especially since sometimes when the hydrangeas are in bloom, depending on where you live and the weather you're having, it might be too hot to really sit outside and enjoy your hydrangea. So you need to bring some indoors. And, you know, hydrangeas do make excellent cut flowers. The panicle and smooth hydrangeas, you can pretty much cut practically as much as you want. The big leaf hydrangeas, of course, that bloom on old wood. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might want to show a little bit restraint with those just so you're not pruning out too much, which could impact your flower for next year. But on the other hand, if that's what you want, it's your plant. You can do whatever you want. You're the, you're the boss of your own garden, which is, 
you know, one of the things I love about gardening. Oh, me too. And I love cut flowers or fresh flowers. So I wrote uh, a little limerick, just Ooh. a real short limerick for We're in limerick you season. And limerick season. Limerick for Stacy and Adriana, and for our listeners and our viewers. Here you go. A little cut flower prose. Fresh flowers, my thing, I suppose. Their beauty is my oasis. Replenished on a vase to vase basis. You could say I garden with my nose. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Yeah. It, I mean, isn't it great to have, do you say vase or vase? I say vase. Thank you. So do I. I don't have anything that costs as much as a vase. <laughs> <laughs> They're strictly vases. Ah, I see. It's either a vase or a vase <laughs> contingent on the cost I of mean, the container. I mean, don't you think? Probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I would agree with you. Well said, Stacy. Uh, but- uh, I love uh, a vase of flowers in the bathroom or the kitchen or dining area or whatever. It's just a great thing to do. Now, uh, when you go out there and you cut your flowers, whether they're daisies uh, or roses or whatever they may be, probably a good idea to do it in the cool of the day, morning or late evening, and get them right into water. If right? you can. If you can. I, if this is one of those do as I say and not as I do <laughs> kind of situations, because rarely do I wake up first thing in the morning and go, oh, I'm going to make a lovely arrangement for dinner tonight. It's more like, oh, I got about five minutes before the water boils for dinner. Guess I'll go cut a few things and make an arrangement for the table. But that's the beauty of it. It's impulsive. Yes. But if you can cut in the morning... Uh, that is a good idea, especially at the height of summer, because, you know, the sun starts to take a toll, things start to wilt, and in the morning, everything is fresh and fully hydrated, and so your flowers, of course, will last longer, but I would never let that stop you. You know, in gardening, there's a lot of things that we say, this is a best practice, or this is what we recommend, but that doesn't, I, right. I often tell people, we garden in the real world, right. not this ideal world. Right. So. And sometimes that's by the seed of your plants, and that's okay. <laughs> now, probably a good idea to pluck off some of the foliage, keep the foliage out of the water, obviously fresh uh, water. And in many cases, when we clip these flowers in our garden, just like with container gardening, we're thinking focal or thriller, filler, spiller, or something along that line. But you really don't have to make it that complicated if you were just to clip some flowers. Sometimes just one type of flower thrown into a vase is Beautiful. Yeah, and uh, very simple. It doesn't need to be complex. And, you know, if you are interested in cut flowers, Instagram is a great place to get some inspiration. You know, you can just search cut flowers. And you're going to see stuff there that I think is very aspirational, mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, is being made by professional florists yes. or people who are just extremely talented at arranging flowers. But everyone has that creativity and that ability in themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, certainly take that as inspiration, but don't let it hamper you and say, oh, mine will never look as good as so-and-so's or, you know, Know, whatever it, it can be as simple as just a single flower if you have the right vase and uh not all my arrangements look great, but I enjoy making them and looking at them all. So yeah. I used to participate in a cut flower arranging contest. You had five minutes to put the arrangement together, and I would compete against others. And you'd be amazed how intimidating it is for some people to be facing that vase and trying to put an arrangement together. And I agree with you. Just you know, think natural and have some fun with it. Yeah, definitely. That's what I do. All right. So uh, zinnias are a great one. Uh, Gomphrina, daisies, uh, heliopsis, alliums, uh, cosmos, of course, rock and salvia or perennial salvia, lavender. Do you have a favorite you like to cut? For lavender? No, oh. uh, any kind of flower to cut and put in a vase. Well, <laughs> at the moment, I'd say daffodils. Ah. <laughs> And, and you know what? I Daffodils are so great in the garden, of course, but they're great indoors. And so what I usually find is like some daffodils that are blooming, like facing my neighbor's yard or, you know, in some part of the yard where I don't go very often and I cut those and bring them in. But, you know, there's I think daffodils are so wonderful because they're such a great it, like they're your first real cut flower right. of the season, you right. know? Um, but yeah, during the season, I pretty much anything is fair game. It just, it really depends. I've used, I use a lot of alliums, of course. I've used oregano flowers. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's a nice little dinner table arrangement. Well, and of course, uh, let's not limit ourselves. Again, flowering shrubs, proven winners, color choice shrubs. Stacy has a wonderful flowering shrub coming up in Plants on Trial. And uh, with some of these woody shrubs, uh, Stacy, we can force them into bloom early in the season in the house, too. Yeah, get a little sneak peek of spring. Love that. Love it. Love it. So Plants on Trial is coming up next. Don't miss it. The plant uh, that Stacy will share with us, of course, you could use for your cut flower garden or just enjoy in your landscape. 
That's coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's the time of the show where we put a plant on trial, which is to say we're going to talk about one of the 320-plus proven winners color choice shrubs, and you get to decide if you are going to add it to your garden. Now, every time we put a plant on trial, I think about... What does Rick want to talk about in the first segment of the show? Oh, and I try to tie nice it in. You. you know, I like to ha- I like things to be cohesive, and I like usually it. I can find some tie-in somehow. It might be a little bit roundabout, but today's was easy. Okay, because today's plant on trial is show off for Scythia. What a beauty, isn't it? And oh. you know, so it's it's late April here in Michigan, the end of April, in fact. And so I know we have listeners from all over the country, and in fact, all over the world, which we're going to find out a little bit about in our next segment. But uh, so I know a lot of our listeners are like, Forsythia, that was a month ago. (laughs) What are you guys talking (laughs) about? But here in West Michigan, Forsythia is at its peak. And it never fails to amaze me every single year how the whole world just explodes in yellow at this time of year, because Forsythia is such a nondescript plant. The rest of the year, it just kind of sits there doing its thing, not looking bad, not looking too exciting, just green and living. Just humdrum. Which is cool. Mm -hmm. You know, that's better than not living. Right. Uh, True. And not green. Good point. (laughs) But (laughs) you really realize how widespread Forsythia is at this time. You cannot drive down a single road through a single neighborhood that is just not exploding in yellow. And it's such a, a joyous thing. I mean, I just, I really love that we get this reminder um, of how much forsythia is out there. And I also, of course, it makes a great cut flower. Bright yellow puts a smile on your face every time you see it. means winter is over. Yeah. I saw it driving up here to the studio today here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. It put a smile on my face. Yeah, yeah you can't miss it. Mm. <laughs> it's very bright. Um, and uh, what I love about using forsythia as a cut flower, first of all, it's very easy to arrange. It pairs beautifully with daffodils or any other spring bulbs that you have in your yard. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about when hydrangeas bloom and cutting hydrangeas and how sometimes with big leaf hydrangeas, hydrangeas that bloom on old wood, you might want to be a little bit more restrained Mm -hmm. in how much you prune because it could impact next year's flowering. With a forsythia, you can practically cut as much as you want and it will be just fine. So they're they're really durable and they're really tough. Now, I picked show off forsythia uh, for today's plant on trial. We have a series. So show off is a series of forsythia that we offer. And the show-off, just show-off on its own, is sort of the original and flagship. And it's a full-size forsythia. So it gets to be about five to six feet tall, which is like sort of medium. Some forsythia can be well over 10 or 12 feet, especially they when they get, get old. They can get rather rangy. They can get a little bit rangy. Is that a word? That's absolutely a word. Thank yes. you. <laughs> and they have a very good way to describe what forsythia might do. Um, but uh, show-off forsythia we selected, as with the other plants in the series, Show Off Sugar Baby and Show Off Starlet. Um, those are more dwarf versions. Okay. So Show Off uh, Sugar Baby is, is really short, just like two feet tall. Starlet's sort of in the middle around four. And then you've got uh, the original Show Off at five to six feet tall and okay. wide. Now, you were talking uh, earlier in the show about um, some forsythia experiencing dieback uh, or not flowering yeah. where they uh, were not protected by snow. Yeah, you'll see some areas in Michigan or Minnesota where uh, you'll see them blooming below the snow line once the snow clears and above the snow in the exposed portion of the plant. Sometimes we lose those blooms. Yes. Now, the original shelf is five to six feet tall. Okay. So if you, and it's hardy to USDA zone five. So if you live in a colder area, it's probably not going to do well. But this is interesting. We have heard reports from growers and gardeners in much colder areas that our little show off sugar baby, since it's only two feet tall, actually has better cold tolerance because it's completely covered by the snow in those colder climates. Mm. So even though that one also says USDA Zone 5, and we're saying that because that's about where you would expect a good performance, a lot of nice blooms. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you are consistently seeing dieback on your forsythia, it's not flowering as much as you would like it to, um, consider one of these smaller ones, particularly if you live in an area where there's reliable snow cover in the winter, in the coldest part of the winter. Talk about an easy grow to plant, uh, easy to grow <laughs> plant. How did I phrase that? You said easy, easy, whatever, plant. easy plant. Yeah. Oh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> talk about an easy to grow plant. Uh, Forsythia is uh, is one of those, and I, I guess I'd consider it one of those plants that's just a harbinger of spring. It is, and so we're talking about how easy it is to grow. It is very shade tolerant. Oh. 
very deer resistant. Now I have not, I have a, a forsythia. It's not a show of forsythia, but oh. just an old fashioned one in my yard that was there when we bought the house and the deer never touch it. You, no. do you, have you, have you seen that? No, I, that's fabulous. I, your deer do not have an appetite for forsythia. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. I, mm. I don't exactly know why. It's certainly not related to the plant family because there's other members of the plant family that, that deer will eat. But that's one of the big advantages, I think, and probably one of the reasons why it does seem so ubiquitous at this time of the year because the deer didn't damage it. Mm. Um, and as far as the shade tolerance goes, now I do consider them quite shade tolerant. The more shade they get, particularly if you are in cooler areas like here in Michigan or through the Midwest, um, the more you're going to see that impact the flowering. So they'll still probably flower a bit. Okay. But not as much as they would if they were in full sun. Now, as you get into those hotter climates, that shade uh, becomes more imperative, obviously, because the plant can get more stress. But uh, show up for Scythia is heat tolerant all the way down to USDA zone 9. That's like solid Florida. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, so a broad range where you can grow this uh, this forsythia. Let me share a little musical information with Ooh. you here. Have you ever heard of a zither? I have, yes. Yeah, a zither. In Korea, it's a musical instrument where the strings cover the entire length of the soundboard, so they use Paulinia wood mm, to mm -hmm. make the zither, but here's the interesting thing. Here's where I'm going with it. The bow that they use to play the zither is made of forsythia. It's peeled forsythia branches hardened with pine resin. Oh. And I guess the only reason I bring this up is, um, hey, if you're ever on some TV show where they ask you the question, then you'll know what it is. <laughs> and, you know, I... There's, there's always room for random facts on yeah, the Gardening Simplified facts. podcast. We love them. <laughs> we, I did not know that, but I can remember, you know, on the playground or whatever when I was a kid, peeling the forsythia stems yes. because they do peel very easily. Right. Exactly. So anyway, lots of good things about growing forsythia. You can get your zither bow. You can get cut flowers. <laughs> the deer are going to resist it. Um, and it's not finicky about soil. And, you know, a lot of people do have questions about, oh, can it take this kind of soil? Forsythia can pretty much take any kind of soil. I wouldn't recommend it for very, very wet soils. Mm -hmm. But even if it's a soil that's occasionally wet, like from, you know, a lot of spring rain or a lower spot in your yard, really not going to be a problem. I mean, they they can take pretty much anything. Well, and you mentioned earlier uh, daffodils. Uh, forsythia is a great plant to plant some daffodils around or some tulips because generally you're going to get them to bloom around the same time. And of course, here in the north also, we use forsythia as an indicator right. for some of the things that we need to do in the yard when soil temperatures, air temperatures warm up enough and we have some turf care to do. So talk about a functional, wonderful plant. And you know what else? It's a great hedge. And oh, we talk yeah. about we've talked about hedges before, and I think if you are looking for a very low maintenance hedge that makes sense that you can just kind of let it go, but has one absolutely fantastic moment that's going to make people s slam on the brakes in their car as they're driving. For Scythia is a great choice for that. That's great. It takes almost <laughs> almost nothing, and no worries about fertilizer pruning. I mean, you can prune a forsythia if you have a forsythia and you're sitting there wondering, well, when do I prune it? That would be after it finishes blooming. So forsythia bloom on old wood. That means they have their flower buds all through winter, which is why they can sometimes have that issue with, you know, damage like we talked about from winter cold. So you want to let your forsythia bloom and then prune it. And then it has all, all season long to recover and make more flower buds for next year. So they don't strictly need it. But a lot of people say, as you said, they get rangy. If you have an older variety that's not selected for such a nice, you know, compact habit, you might be thinking you want to prune it, and after it blooms is the time. That's a great idea. William Forsyth, or Forsyth, whatever his name was, the Scottish botanist who the plant is named after would be proud of us. Yeah, you know, it's you bring up a good point because I was going to say, in England, they call it Forsythia. Aha, uh -huh, so uh, his name was probably Forsythe. So his name was Forsythe. Okay. And here in the U.S., we started calling it Forsythia. And yes, even though Forsythia is technically correct, uh, your garden center is probably going to look at you a little bit funny <laughs> if you go in there asking for a Forsythia. And, you know, as I've said before on the show, when it comes down to pronunciation, the important thing is you walk away with what you wanted. And I'm not sure Forsythia will get you there. So <laughs> on that note, we need to take a little bit of a break. But when we come back, we're going to be answering in your garden questions, so please stick around. Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. You know, we've been doing the show for a little over six months now, 
And I just want to say we appreciate everyone who listens and watches on YouTube so very much. And it's been really interesting to hear from people as they leave comments or write into the show. And if you have a question for us and you want to write in, you can reach us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or just email help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. But Adriana told me we had an interesting YouTube comment that I wanted to share with all of our listeners. And she says, I have more than 100 containers in my tiny front garden garden over 100 water vessels all with plants in them in my 26 by 26 foot backyard and too many pots to count i live in a villa house must be narrow must be six foot narrower than the land the two three foot concrete baths on either side are full of hanging plants or hanging baskets and container plants i live in one of the hottest driest cities on earth adelaide south australia it rarely gets to freezing, even here, in, even in winter. We don't have the freeze-thaw issue. I've never seen snow in my six-plus decades of life. <laughs> I'm an avid gardener, and I'm finding this YouTube channel very useful and interesting. So Let me mention, as far as the snow is concerned, and, and this is wonderful. Thank you for the comment. As far as the snow is concerned, let me tell you, the novelty wears off real fast. Yes, okay, You're really not missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> you aren't missing anything. Um, but, you know, when Adriana read me this comment, I was like, wow, that's so cool. I really wonder what their garden looks like. And this listener graciously shared her Instagram account. So uh, if you want to see what her very interesting garden in Adelaide, Love. South Australia looks like, you can find her on Instagram at Carrie Jean Harvey. That's K E R R Y J E A N. R-V-H-A-R-V-E-Y. H-A-R-V-E-Y. And of course, we'll put that in the show notes. So we just want to thank our listeners from near and far. And, you know, we hear you and you say, can you talk about more heat tolerant stuff? Can you talk about more cold tolerant stuff? And we'll get to it all sooner or later. So I love it. You know, I'm the type of person who would say that's a real kick in the plants. Although in Australia, I guess they say better than a kick up the backside. So wonderful. Thank you for your message. <laughs> yes, thank you. So what do we have in the gardener mailbag today, Rick? Uh, Althea writes to us, why does my snowball viburnum shrub tree not bloom? It's been in the ground for two and a half seasons. Looks very healthy. I'm so new at this gardening thing, I have no clue. It has never bloomed. What fertilizer? I've used Hollytone, Plant Tone. Help me, please. So um, a lot of people, you know, when something doesn't bloom, their first thought is fertilizer. And that's not a bad thought because it's true that flowering from a plant's perspective takes a lot of energy. And so if a plant is stressed or low on nutrients or otherwise, you know, senses like, hey, I got to conserve my energy. I'm, I'm experiencing bad things here. Um, it might not flower. But really, especially when it comes to flowering shrubs, the number one question I always go to is pruning. Because that is by Agreed. far the main reason Agreed. that someone's shrub Hello. wouldn't bloom. And so snowball viburnums, which are um, viburnum placatum tomentosum, beautiful plant. A lot of people mistake them for hydrangeas because they do look similar to the untrained eye. I wanted to say that because that's actually one I can pronounce. But go ahead, proceed. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Didn't mean to steal your thunder there, Rick. Uh, so... Um, it blooms on old wood, which is to say that it fl- it creates its flowers in the summer, carries them all through winter, and comes out, starts blooming in the early spring. And so if it gets pruned pretty much any time from, you know, June until it starts to bloom in May, you're going to be cutting off the flower buds. So my first thought to you, Althea, is has it been pruned or cut back at all? And if that's the case, then you've got a very easy solution. Just stop pruning it and it should come into bloom. Probably not this year. It's going to be too late, but don't prune it coming up. And then you should at least be able to look forward to flowers next year. It's also important, even though viburnum are generally quite deer resistant, the plant itself, I have found when I've tried to grow viburnum in my yard, the deer will eat the flower buds. Oh, yeah. Um, You know, they don't really damage the rest of the plant, which makes you not even realize that they had been there because they're so good at just taking out that little tiny flower bud and you don't notice like, whoa, the deer were here and there's a bunch of jagged branches sticking out all over the place. It's not like that. It's just like you barely even notice and then... There's just no flowers. Yeah, I've seen that. Even squirrels, I've seen uh, nip at the buds. But boy, you nailed it, Stacey. I mean, if you prune too early in spring or you're pruning in late fall, you're going to lose those blooms. And that's why, you know, pruning sounds so complicated, but that's why I always tell people, you know, if you're not quite sure, pruning right after a plant is done flowering usually works out pretty decent. Yeah, there's very few exceptions to that. So that is a, a good 
guideline to follow. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, Althea, is that you mentioned it's only been in the ground for two and a half seasons. And I don't know what size plant you started off with, but particularly if it was a very small one, mm. it could just be that it needs more time. Um, you know, typically if you're, if you're starting with a larger, like three or five gallon plant that you would get at the garden center, you're probably going to get it flowering within, you know, the first two years after sure. flowering. But if you started with like a little plant that you would have gotten online or, you know, a cutting from a friend or something like that, it's probably going to need more time. And, you know, it's always good to keep in mind the old gardener's adage, first year leap, first year sleep, second year creep, third year leap. So first year it's just sleeping. You're not going to see a lot. The second year it's creeping. Most of the action's taking place underground while it establishes roots. And then in the third year, that's when it's really ready. It's had the time to get established, really ready to start strutting its stuff. So no pruning, a little more time. And I think, Althea, if you don't see flowers this year, you're in good shape for them next year. I love this question. Marlo writing to us from Dallas, Texas. I'm in Dallas zone 8A. I'm really interested in the decadence, false indigo, lemon meringue. Uh, etc. This is the Baptisia that Stacy and I will often talk about, a favorite of ours. Uh, she wants it for a sunny spot in her garden. I have never seen it here in any of the nurseries. Would it do well here? Uh, also, are some of the colors larger than others? Will the tap root be a problem if I ever need to remove it? Please let me know the pros and cons and where I may be able to find it. By the way, I want to mention that uh, I have spent time in the Dallas area, and I do know that Callaway's in Dallas is a proven winner's certified uh, location. And also the great people at Nicholson Hardy, uh, I've visited there also before, and maybe those are two places to try, or at least ask them. Yeah, they definitely have a great selection of garden centers in the Dallas area, so I would start with those. And all of that is to say that absolutely 100%, you can grow false indigo, Baptisia, in Dallas. In fact, Baptisia absolutely. is native all the way down to Texas. Okay. So even though these varieties um, that proven winners perennials have introduced have been you know, developed for specific colors or that kind of thing, the actual species itself is native to Texas, so it's set up to do very well for you. Um, of these varieties, they're all lovely, but lemon meringue is by far the biggest and most vigorous. So if you're really looking for something that is going to you know, fill in quick and be super robust and reliable, I would say go with lemon meringue, hands down. I have a bunch of them and the color is amazing. And they're just, even though I have a bunch of the decadent series, I find that that variety is can definitely withstand my drought and sun and everything the best out of all of them. No, I agree. And Stacy, uh, yeah, you nailed it. I looked it up, uh, zones 4A to 9B, so easily okay. yep. grown in the, uh, in the Dallas area. And, you know, if you go to Proven Winners website also, you can, uh, they have a feature there where you can look for retailers. So, yep. again, I would recommend that. But Callaway's or Nicholson Hardy, that's where I'd start. And I do want to just uh, address your concern about the tap root. So I think we had joked a few shows ago about trying to move a Baptisia, uh, which is a monumental task. Their root systems are incredible. And the answer to that is the tap root is only a problem if you're trying to transplant it. In other words, if you're trying to keep it alive while you're digging it out, then the tap root's a problem. If all you want to do is get rid of the plant, it won't be a problem. It'll take some work, <laughs> but it's not going to like stay and, and, you know, be like a dandelion where it keeps coming up. Um, if you're able to dig any portion, any substantial portion of the root mass out, you won't have any trouble. But they do go quite deep. And so this is one of those plants that, like peonies, you're going to want to commit to that location for a good long time and avoid. This isn't one, you know, Rick and I are big fans of saying, we changed your mind. We want to move it somewhere else. I think this would look better here. Baptisia is, is not one of those plants that let you do that. I bend over and split my plants all the time. I have a lot of practice doing that. So <laughs> have fun. All right, we oh, think we have time for one last one there. Sure. Barbara writes about clematis. I have this clematis for about five years. First blooms are gorgeous. Then the leaves start to die. I ask at a local nursery but the, uh, about it, but they didn't know how to help. Right. So um, Barbara did send in a photo, which, of course, we'll put on the show notes and in the YouTube show so you can see all this. And, you know, when I first read Barbara's question, I was like, oh, clematis wilt, right. which we talked about, you know, mm -hmm. on our clematis show. Very common um, fungal disease that happens a little bit later in the season. But what 
I saw in Barbara's picture is that her clematis has a virus. Yikes. Um, and virus in plants uh, is a lot of people miss it because it looks like variegation. Yes. And they, all they think, oh, all of a sudden my plant's variegated. <laughs> um, but it does have a very distinctive look to it. And it's yellow. You'll see it if you if you go to the Gardening Simplified on air.com show notes. And um, so I don't know if the clematis wilt is the wilting that she's seeing is related to the virus or not. It could be. It also could just be that it's more susceptible to clematis wilt because the virus is gradually weakening the plant. It's flowering beautifully. Um, but I would say, Barbara, as beautiful as your clematis is, this is a situation where I would advise you remove it. Um, and I hate to say that, but there's really no cure for plant viruses. And what happens when you have a virus plant in your garden is that the little hopping insects, you know, leaf hoppers, aphids, mites, anything that goes around and sucks your plant, it will take that to other clematis mm. in your neighborhood. Usually it's, it's specific to the plant. So um, I hate to say it, Barbara, but I think this clematis... Clematis needs to go. Clematis, clematis. Let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Sorry, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but sometimes that's just the way it is in gardening. So we need to take a little bit of a break, but when we come back, we're going to have an interview with a landscape designer. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Normally, we would have our branching news, not breaking news, as Rick says, branching news. But today, we have a special guest interview. We have Renee Claremont from Second Nature Designs on Martha's Vineyard Island, Massachusetts. And Renee is a landscape and garden designer, and she's going to be telling us a bit about container gardening because I know Renee one of the things you do in your business um, is quite a lot of uh, container designs and so tell us a bit about what you do and what your business is like over there on Martha's Vineyard Island. Okay hi guys thanks so much for asking me to be on your show I really appreciate it and are excited to, to chat about flowers. Um, I have a business a landscape design business that I started in 2022. I was actually just a gardener with a shovel and a pickup truck and over the next what 20 years or so I've kind of evolved into different scopes um, within my business landscape design being one garden design um, container gardening and I do garden consults oh. So, uh, yeah, so I keep myself busy year round, even though the gardening in New England is not year round. I myself personally am busy. Yeah, somehow in our industry, we managed to, uh, and, and everyone says, oh, you've got the downtime right now, right? You're like, no, no, we don't have any <laughs> such thing as no, downtime. No. If we're not talking exactly. about gardening, we're either doing it or thinking about it. So when exactly. it comes to designing a container, um, what do you consider first, the container itself or the plants or the environment? Sort of what's your approach to starting a, a container design project? That's a really good question. I think all of the above, Stacey. So I um, started as a floral designer before I got into gardening. And the design principles of doing a live um, floral arrangement is basically the approach that I take for my containers. So I follow the same uh, principles, whether it's with the color, the repetition, texture, foliage, I definitely consider the sunlight um, where the planters are going to go. Obviously, that's a huge component on which plant material I'm going to pick for that specific um, job site. And, you know, I, I should have mentioned, uh, if our listeners are interested in seeing your work, Renee, they can visit secondnaturedesignsmv.com. So MV from Martha's Vineyard, secondnaturedesignsmv.com. And, you know, when I was on your website, you have some beautiful examples of your work, and it's a great place to go for some inspiration, especially on container design. Um, I see that a lot of your work is for businesses in town. Yes. Yes. I love doing commercial. <laughs> And so how does that change your approach? Like I see a lot of them and I know here in our, our small towns on the West Michigan Lakeshore, um, like window boxes are very right. you know popular. So how do you go about sort of deciding what plants you're going to use in a window box in town versus, you know, a big container poolside in a private residence? Right. And there, you know, it's, it's funny because um, I, I really don't, I really don't have a um, an idea of what plants I'm going to use, and it really kind of depends on where the container is. So, um, 
if I have a shady area at a residential and a shady area at commercial, it doesn't really change my scope of what I'm looking for at the plant nursery. Um, I think it, it, it's what looks good to me that day. <laughs> so I bring in all of, I bring in all of my plants, most of my plants. I get truckloads um, from Proven Winners and other various uh, growers um, around this time of the year. So I set up a nursery at, at the farm is what I call um, my mini, mini nursery. It's just what looks really good to me that day. It could be all foliage. Uh, that usually is something that I always put in a container, whether it's residential or commercial. Foliage is the highlight. Usually, um, I should say it's the low light of my container. So, for instance, say I have um, a bubblegum petunia as a trailer in, in one of my window boxes or containers. I will then follow up with a foliage plant in a either darker or lighter color depending on the flower itself. So, if I have a bubblegum soft pink flower, I will then maybe use a dark foliage plant that doesn't necessarily produce flowers, but it's a dark foliage. And that's going to make that pink of the bubblegum petunia really pop out at you. I take into account that, you know, people might brush up against it. Um, but I usually do the maintenance there. So I know that it's well taken care of, you know, that that's my, my name that's going into that, that design. So I typically am, am in control of um, the outcome of it. Renee, you mentioned earlier flower arranging. So if we yeah. look at the container as a thriller, filler, spiller concept, that thriller or that focal plant uh, within the container for our viewers and our listeners, can you share with us a few plants that you like to oh. reliably use as the feature plant or the thriller plant in your containers? Oh, you want the special soft secret. <laughs> yes, um, I do. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, I mean, if you have a window box, typically I don't have a thriller because it's a long, narrow planting space. Sure. Um, I use more of a repetition um, in window boxes, but in containers, whether they, they're square or round planters, pots, um, I typically like to use a tropical in the center. So a mandevilla, a hibiscus, something that um, is going to get a little bit larger and have a continuous flower throughout the season. And then I will fill in with my thriller, my fillers, my fillers. Um, I know a lot of people use that recipe for planting. It's just easy to, to, you know, to remember something like that. But if you purchase a tropical plant, Usually, they are not on the outside of a greenhouse. They're on the inside of a greenhouse at a nursery. Um, that's where, where you'll mostly find them. I, you know, I would agree as far as tropical plants are concerned. Two favorites of mine, cannas uh, as the thriller, mm -hmm. and the other would be cordyline uh, because of the beautiful, uh, colorful foliage. But, you know, that brings up the point that uh, can, one of the aspects of container gardening that we love is that it gives you flexibility. In other words, when we garden and we plant in the ground, we're making a commitment. But when we plant exactly. containers, we have the opportunity to change them out and uh, be a little more creative, probably. And definitely be a little bit more creative. You're working in a smaller space mm -hmm. um, and the plants intertwine more than it, it would in like the square footage of a garden. You know, you, you typically wouldn't put six or seven different plants within a two foot radius in the garden. Cause it would just kind of look silly unless you repeated that same rotation all the way throughout the garden, then it would make sense to you. Um, that's why I said containers are like doing a, a, a vase full of flowers. You know, you put the tall stuff in and then you do the filler stuff in and then, you know, a focal lily or rose. Um, it's, it's basically, it's a miniature flower. It's actually, I should say it's a miniature garden in a container. Yeah, that's what you say on your website. Uh, yeah, let's see, yeah. alluring gardens in a miniature scale. And, you know, I think you bring up a really good point about shopping the whole garden center in the inside of the greenhouse and not the outside of the greenhouse. Because I've right. even found myself guilty of this where I'm like, oh, I'm just looking for like one more really special thing for my containers. And I'm just like walking right by the houseplant section going, oh, no, no, I don't need any houseplants right now. When the <laughs> fact is so many of those would make a fantastic container centerpiece and could also even be repurposed as a houseplant at exactly. the end of the season. Exactly. Great point. That is a great point. Um, probably 90% of my plants 
uh, that I take out at the end of the season. I, I either give it back to the homeowners or I recycle it. Um, I typically try to keep them in my house, but, <laughs> you know, I end up with like 500 plants in my house and it doesn't work. But if you have a greenhouse or friends, you can give them out to friends. But yes, use foliage house plants, ferns, ivies. Ivies are great for filler plants and fillers. Um, they have just that beautiful waxy green texture. You can also get them in a variegated. So many different types of foliage house plants that you would not even think snake plants. I know everybody has a snake plant or most people have a snake plant as a house plant. That is a great focal for a container. That's an yeah. interesting take. I, I might try that myself. Now, I'm going to ask you if you can help me with a problem that I have, but I'm guessing a lot of our listeners have as well. And that mm-hmm. is that I have a container problem. Um, when I go to the garden center, I fall in love with a container and I mm. fork over the money for it. And then I get it home and I'm like, wait a minute, this does not really go with the rest of my containers. Oh. You know, I've kind of acquired them over the years and they're all my tastes. So there's some, you know, underlying sort of theme or, or cohesion. But, you know, do you have tips for people like me who kind of accumulate containers over time? on um, bringing them into like a cohesive whole that looks like, um, you know, an actual designer did it and not just a crazed plant maniac. That's good though, Stacey. Is it the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse? What came first, the plant or the container? Exactly. It ends up looking like your kitchen cabinet with a whole bunch of different plates and forks and and glasses matches, nothing matches. Um, So I do have a great tip actually um, for the hoarders that we all are with our containers. Um, I do the same thing. I buy a few and I'm like, oh, I really like this. And next year it's either not available or um, what have you. So spray paint. No. So there is, yeah, you can do the Krylon, you know, the spray paint that comes in all different colors. They actually have a great one now that has a texture and it can give it a stone appearance. So I do that on um, plastic pots because a lot of people, um, collect the plastic pot. Some people just buy planters that already have uh, plants in it at the season and they're in those those ugly gray plastic pots and you don't know what to do with it. You can either use them um, to plant up and put in a bigger pot or you can spray paint it. So the Krylon um, can spray. If you go to your local hardware, whatever Lowe's um, will have hundreds of different colors, but I would highly suggest the textured spray paint that looks like stone. Um, and I think it comes in like gray and they have sand color, but you could spray paint all of them. The only one that I would think would have a little bit of a difficulty is ceramic pots. You might have to do a little bit of prep work on that, maybe a little bit of sanding. But Krylon also sells uh, paint and primer spray paint in all different colors, too. Wow, so that's so a good way to give you that cohesion. A container you know. makeover. <laughs> exactly. I'm, exactly. I'm pretty. You can do that with vases too, with clear vases. Everybody, same thing, same exact thing. You, everybody hoards the the vases that you get from the florist or right. what have you. And we have a cabinet full of all different glass vases. You can either donate them, um, or you can spray paint them. Well, I'm pretty yep. dangerous with a paint can in my hand, so I don't know if I will do that. But oh, uh, come on now! <laughs> you can you can hand paint it with a paintbrush. Yeah, you well, can hand paint it with a paintbrush. Um, if not, you know, if you don't want to go through the whole painting process, um, you can do a cluster of the same type of plants in all of the pots. Well, I've gone to the point with uh, some more porous containers where I've put uh, moss and buttermilk in a blender and blended it up and brushed it on the pots. And it's a great idea. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But uh, yeah, (laughs) I don't know if I'd have the patience to do that, but um, (laughs) that's great. That's a great DIY um, idea. You should put that on Pinterest. Uh, Renee, as far as the pots are concerned, being a, a professional designer with your containers for our viewers and our listeners, the soil, of course, is going to be very important. A drainage hole, yeah. very important. Uh, do you add anything to the soil to ensure your success? In other words, polymers to hold water or uh, slow release fertilizers. What do you advise our viewers and listeners on that on that topic? Um, I would say. Uh, Rule of thumb, cheaper is not always better, especially when it comes to potting soils. 
So you want to look for a good mix that has perlite in it, um, organic matter, and peat moss. Peat moss, and you want to be able to almost like pinch the bag and where you can see your imprint in the bag. So then you know that that's a nice light, fluffy mix. As for adding anything to my containers, I I, I typically don't need to add anything to my containers because I spend the money at the beginning for a good quality. Um, product that has everything that I need. All right, Renee, any uh, container devi- uh, container gardening advice you want to leave us with before we uh, let you go? Try going inside um, the nursery and shopping around and don't necessarily get plants that are in full bloom. If it's not in full bloom, it could be really beautiful in weeks to come. Yes, have faith. That's very important yes. because not every great plant can look amazing yes. in the garden center. Exactly. And read the tags, you know, read the tags and, and see what the requirements are for the plant. And don't over your water your plants. That's like one of the overwatering and the underwatering is usually the death of, of many plants in a container. Yes, that is for sure. And in the ground as well. And in the ground, but more so, more so in a container, more so in a container. I just wet my plants, Renee. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, you're killing me. <laughs> So, Renee, thank you so much for joining us. Now, if if our listeners want to learn more about your business and get some inspiration from your container designs, where can they find you online? Well, like you said, I have my website, which is www.secondnaturedesignsmv.com. I'm also on Instagram, Second Nature Designs MV, Facebook, and Pinterest. All right. So anywhere that people need their garden inspiration, they will find you. And Renee, we want to thank you so much for joining us on the Gardening Simplified Podcast and wishing you a wonderful and peaceful as possible season ahead. Thank you. Happy planting, guys. Thanks, Renee. Well, that was really inspiring. Oh, I'm so ready for spring. I can't contain myself, Stacey. <laughs> if only the weather would cooperate. Well, hopefully mm. it's cooperating in your neck of the woods, wherever you are. Want to thank Rick for joining me on the show today. And of course, to Adriana, our producer and engineer on the other side of the soundboard. And thank you all so much for listening. We appreciate your support and wish you a wonderful week in the garden. <laughs> <laughs>